Uh, let's get a big round of applause for Maggie Young, please. Hi. Uh, hello. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the scalable infrastructure as code, which uh, we implemented uh, inside of the IMG uh, in the last couple of months. Um, something about myself. My name is Mark Dion. I work for IMG for about eight years now. Um, I started as uh, a junior guy in the AAX department and then I moved up a bit towards uh, designing and building stacks and roles. Um, flowed into the Linux department during a reorganization, one of many. Um, and then uh, got into more of uh, automating parts uh, of our infrastructure and how we uh, deliver stuff to the, to the bank. Um, the context uh, where I'm talking about now, uh, we build up uh, our company from an infrastructure perspective. So the ES department what does the hypervisor layer and everything else. Um, I'm from the PaaS department, which deliver the stacks of the OS and the middleware running on it. And then we have a couple of application teams uh, on the business side that build the actual applications uh, and run on our, on our platform. And we have uh, several difficulties inside of the infrastructure department, and we need to fix that. And we're working on that now. Um, we have a very large, large company, which Peter already said, we have about 10,000 people, but we also have over 20,000 systems, basically. Um, and we had some stability issues. Um, in that environment, uh, both with deployment and building as well. Um, with a lot of changes from people that um, configure their system basically, but then um, they break stuff, because they do. Um, and we had uh, a lot of lead time in both deployment and the development part as well, so it took a long time for us to put stuff into production, to, uh, uh, which the application team can then use to build better stuff. Um, so what I already said, we had a, a, a bunch of issues um, during deployment, but deployment was not necessarily the problem we had. Uh, it was in the development part before it to deliver our uh, service. Um, so we were searching for the problem, and one of the biggest is we deploy a standard, and then it gets changed by an application team, and no machine is the same again. It's hard to manage that, because if they break stuff, they come to us to fix it again. Um, so there's a lot of configuration with and. Um, we needed a solution for that, and we started looking for a solution, um, really drilling down into it. And conflict management is one of the big, big problems we had uh, um, in the past. Um, and to get into that, um, we had to get more standardized and get a way of um, automated configuration management and state enforcement um, for the entire stack we deliver. Um, so we ended up um, with Puppet um, for configuration management, but the scope of the change for configuration management grew quite a bit um, because we already wanted uh, everything to be versioned, uh, everything to be automatically tested. Um, and for, to, uh, for us to do that, we needed to build a, a pipeline for infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, which we actually built. Uh, so an automated way of testing, uh, deploying, uh, and building um, code for infrastructure, uh, and to be able to promote, promote that to production, uh, and then it's usable for the customer teams. Um, this is a, a, a drawing of the, the, uh, the CD pipeline we built. Um, it has several metro stations and lanes in it um, because we have several components which integrate together to get a complete stack. Um, and because we built everything with Puppet, um, we of course needed a line for the Puppet part. And for the Puppet code, um, we have a lot of guys developing, developing the Puppet modules uh, to deploy their uh, component. And they all start with pushing their components into Git. Um, inside of Git, a, a webhook gets jumped into our CD pipeline, um, which starts the entire metro station uh, line for every part of it. So if um, the guy from our team pushes something for Puppet into the CD pipeline, um, it, uh, a, a unit test gets done on that Puppet code to see if it's valid, if the style is okay, the syntax is okay. Um, and then it gets a version for that specific uh, module it gets deployed onto a machine and a test runs. Um, but for the test, they need packages because they deliver a component which it needs to be installed. Um, so a second uh, metro state line comes into the, to the game and that's where they build their packages. Um, so for that, we built another metro station, uh, metro line, 
uh, where they can automate it, uh, automatically build their own packages uh, through a, a, a Git repository as well. So they push their package into a Git repository, it automatically gets built, pushed into a repository, and that's then used inside of the pipeline. Uh, but to be able to install the package on something, you need an image, uh, which is actually deployed. Um, and for that, we have an image pipeline as well that automatically builds a, a base image for that deployment. Uh, we use Packer for that, uh, which is a nice HashiCorp tool. Um, and that automatically uh, builds um, our base images for every kind of hypervisor layer there is, uh, for KVM, for VMware, for Vagrant even. Um, so uh, that can be used inside of every environment we got. And it all comes together into uh, the first uh, integration test. So a machine gets deployed, Puppet Run runs, uh, automatically tested um, the Puppet Run as well. Um, and if all is okay uh, with the base tests, uh, it gets promoted into a different environment. Um, we start with unstable, going into a rolling, which is actually a sort of production environment. Um, a machine uh, goes to the same pipeline again with a, a few different steps. And then the, um, a machine gets deployed again, uh, tests get run again, but uh, more tests gets run. So more functional tests as well. So we know the stack that is then deployed is actually a fully functional stack. And once that is done, um, the entire code base, including images, um, packages, and the puppet modules as well, they get promoted into our production puppet environment, which can then be used by the customer teams we have. Um, so our cycle is basically um, a, a, go, a code push gets done into a Git repository, uh, a build process gets done somewhere, uh, especially for packages. Um, once that is done, uh, a deployment thingy runs. Um, once the deploy is finished, uh, we start a puppet run, and uh, after a successful puppet run, we actually start a testing phase uh, of that uh, for, um, deployed code. Um, we do that constantly. And it goes a bit slowly at the moment. Um, <laughs> but we can uh, always speed that up if we get more data and uh, uh, better tests and everything else. So we can get a fully functional deployment. Um, as I already mentioned, we do this with, uh, with Puppet. Uh, so we use Puppet for uh, configuration management. I hope you all know Puppet. You probably do. Um, it's a configuration management tool to um, enforce state on a, on a machine or a system or a network device or whatever. Um, and what you basically do with Puppet is you, you describe the state of how a machine should look like. Um, so you um, describe uh, a machine to be a rel stack with a uh, Tomcat on it, uh, with an Nginx load balancer in front of it. And you describe that in a, a, a couple of modules and together combined uh, it's a catalog that gets used to actually enforce that state. Um, so a machine runs Puppet, it gets its catalog from a central environment and it gets enforced uh, by the Puppet to the, um, with a catalog to that specific state. Uh, once that state is running um, and it changes, it gets rolled back again to the state that is defined in Puppet because that's the state enforcement we have, so we have much more standardization on the entire deployment part. Um, and with that, um, it comes the reporting part as well. So if a machine gets deployed, the puppet run runs, um, you can see what changes are done. Um, and every half an hour, the report gets sent again. If somebody changed something in the report, you can see that someone changed it, or what, what's changed, and maybe they do it on purpose, but we can all see what is happening and have more insight in what we have. Um, together with Puppet, uh, you have the Hida backend, which is there as a key value store. It's uh, built there to split the, the, the code and the data of Puppet. So in Puppet you describe what it is. Um, you can give data there as well, but you want to lose the copy from the code so you can reuse your code. And that's what Hira is for. It's a, used as a key value store with data. Um, to get the scalability we wanted in the, our environment, um, it needs to be highly scalable. So um, not only the puppet environment, because a single puppet master is nicely used, but it can't be used if you have over 10,000 machines, because it doesn't scale and just, just doesn't run if all those machines log into the puppet master. Um, and you want to secure it uh, as well, not only the code, but the data inside of Hira as well. Um, so for the scaling part, uh, we start with the puppet environment first. Um, 
we build a multi-master environment over a couple of data centers um, where every data center has about eight or ten uh, puppet masters. Uh, and all of them are uh, behind a load balancer, which can be used by anyone. So if a machine uh, called does a puppet run, it goes to the load balancer, gets a random uh, puppet master, which are all the same, and then uh, they do their configuration run, and the next run it goes to a different master. But because, because it doesn't matter, every master is built the same and has the same kind of code and data as well. Um, and for the higher part, um, higher is normally, or by default, is a, a, a YAML backend. So there's all, all kinds of configuration, configuration files used inside of Hira, um, which you can manage and put your data in. Uh, the big problem with that is if you have a large environment, um, you can have over 10,000 files which you need to manage uh, for the environment, which is a, a bit of a hassle. It's not really handy to do that. Um, so you need a proper database backend for, for Hira to be able to easily manage that environment. Um, and you want some more security as well, because so normal YAML files are readable for everyone. So you can use eYAML for that uh, to encrypt it, but you still have then files you need to manage, which is rather impossible to do. Um, so we built our own API for, uh, for Hira. Um, the goal of this was uh, to build a self-service portal for the application team so they can manage their own configuration. Um, because uh, the biggest problem we have at the moment is that uh, if an application team deploys their system, like a development system, um, they get a certain version of, of that deployment. Um, if they deploy a week later, they might get another version of that same deployment, but it, does, it doesn't necessarily work the same as the old one. Um, with this, they can enforce certain versions of, of their stack, of the stack that we deliver, so they can all have the same environment uh, 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 everywhere. And also with that API, um, people can use that API to change certain specifications of their uh, configuration of the machine and do performance tuning and everything else with the code we already live. And the other part is that that API needs to be in the air always. Um, and to be able to do that, we, uh, so we wrote our own uh, API. Um, it's an API currently built in Python uh, with a lot of dependencies. Um, it's, I'm not a software developer, so I, I build it and, uh, with the mind of keeping it restful. Uh, it wasn't entirely possible you know, uh, with my current uh, version, um, but I did the, the best I could at the time. Uh, so I built an API with a Cassandra backend. Uh, the normal option probably would be to go to Couch or uh, any Redis backend or whatever. Um, but there wasn't a lot of um, knowledge about the other backends inside of our environment. Um, and we already, already had a big um, Cassandra landscape inside of the ING. So we thought we would use that as our backend um, and write our own API in front of it and use Cassandra as the data backend. Um, so we build our own API, which is sort of looks like this if you go look to the Swagger interface. Um, so there are a couple of endpoints. Um, uh, some of them are uh, to push keys. You can push multiple configurations uh, to the, the, the backend. Uh, and something about facts as well, which is used by puppets to configure a specific machine and how it looks like. Um, currently, uh, as I already mentioned, it's written in Python. Um, and it's a bit of a hassle to deploy it at the moment. Um, so we're currently looking into a way to write it into possibly Go or Scala or whatever um, to keep it um, get a bit more lightweight, a bit faster, and um, a more portable place. Um, the, the 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 big things uh, we learned during this move is that we were a bit behind in version control. Not everything was version controlled. Um, so we made a big move that everything, every team that uh, does something from a past perspective has to put their code into uh, to a version control. Um, with that, um, and with the pipeline, we made sure that everything gets automated through the pipeline. So building, testing, and everything else. Um, with this, everything gets standardized because we have a standard way of working with the puppet environment, and everything gets enforced to stay the same way as well inside of the environment. Um, we introduced some more testing. We already did a lot of manual testing, but it took ages. 
Um, now with this framework that we built, um, we have a lot of automated testing um, and a, a lot of better, better tested environments and we can deliver faster. Um, we have more insight because we have more standardized way of working and deploying and can see what got changed on which environment. Um, we, if, uh, we dramatically decreased our uh, time we need to deliver and de uh, develop a new offering towards the application team, which automatically gives us more time to deliver new tools and um, a better way of working with this environment. Um, and quite quick. Um, so the the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will have. It was quicker than I thought. Um, possibly questions. Probably, <laughs> probably questions. <laughs> so okay. who, who wants to ask a question? <laughs> okay. uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, so this kind of graphic which you uh, platform your infrastructure as a service, so that means basically your data center, let's say simply, uh, where your hardware is sitting. Uh, my question was simple. How does um, ING consider this one? Yeah, exactly. This one. Mm -hmm. So below we have the just Yagi IS. <laughs> How does ING consider the cloud computing as a solution for the scalability of your services? Um, currently within ING we're building a private cloud, um, which can be used to automatically deploy machines a bit faster and get more scalability on the uh, system level. Um, yeah. I'm not entirely sure about what, where that is going for the rest uh, of the of the cloud part. Okay. Um, no, just uh, that question, just to understand a bit what was the vision for the future? Because if yeah. we are talking about scalability, uh, you cannot avoid such a uh, such an investment. I mean. Uh, yeah. You cannot buy tomorrow 600 racks because you need to increase your capacity no, and your availability. Good. So that was my question. Thank you. Next question. Yes, you may ask So, when a team needs a new environment, how does it work with an IG? For the development team decides they need a new test environment or some. Well, they go to, uh, into a self-service portal where they can deploy a new system, saying yes. that it's a development. Uh, it's not necessarily part of what we built at the moment. Uh, this is the part that delivers the, um, the deployable artifact, basically, towards uh, that, uh, that orchestrator that does the deployment. So this is the development part in front of the deployment. Um, did you look into any alternatives to Puppet? And if so, why did you choose Puppet? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Um, I'm not going into that discussion. <laughs> uh, I don't know Puppet. So yeah. <laughs> well, the, uh, at the time where, where we started it, um, Puppet was for us the best solution. There are several others, like Salt or Ansible or Chef or you can name a few of them. Um, <laughs> we tried a couple. Um, but um, through some, uh, how can you say this? Um, we had some difficulties in our environment to use some of them uh, based on security or connectivity or whatever. Um, and Puppet was for us the easiest way to go towards uh, a centralized <coughs> environment for configuration management. Um, any more questions? I've got a question. Is it open source? Yes. Um, I want the Go version to be open source, yes. I've got, an, I got the repository already, but it, there's no code yet. Just a readme. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the readme and the license. Watch this space. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, cool. Well, if there are no more questions, then we'll finish nice and early. Let's get a big round of applause for Mike.